Please show your appreciation for Andre's recital. Well, welcome to event four of the 69 events uh, at this year's Festival of the Sound. Concerts, conversations, and cruises, three Cs. Uh, cruises here on Georgian Bay in Paris Sound, Ontario. Uh, today, I'm delighted that we're starting these uh, series of conversations with a longtime colleague and friend of mine, Andre Laplante. And Andre's been playing Liszt, as we all know, a wonderful recital of Liszt's, uh, the first book of the Année de Pèlerinage, the Italian book. And that begs a question, Andre, why the first book? Why the Anne de Pellerinage? Uh, it was actually the second, right? Second book, I, I'm yeah, so sorry. Yeah, okay, sorry. First book I, is I, the thought, Swiss book. I thought, <laughs> I thought, I thought I played, that's right, that one, that one is the first. Sorry. Uh, why? Well, because, well, for many reasons. I mean, I think I play, I play a lot of his music. Uh, through the years, I learned an enormous amount of repertoire by Liszt because I think he really had, I mean, to be very clear about it, I think he really had a bum rap. You know, in his in his uh, in his legacy and in his history, I think we have to separate uh, two elements with this. Uh, we have to separate the medium element, what is pianistic, mm -hmm. uh, and what is musical. I mean, we really have to look at it that way. Everything he composed is extraordinarily pianistic, well composed for the, the medium because he was a great pianist himself. The problem was he, 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 was live, he was raised as a child prodigy, obviously, and he started doing tours when he was six, seven years old. He ended up playing for Beethoven when he was nine, I think, or something. Uh, you know, he was everywhere and he was very known as a, as a young uh, child prodigy like this. Uh, and I think that he did not particularly maybe relish being a child prodigy, and, but it, it stuck with him uh, for a lot of his life, especially in his 20s, where I think uh, he, he felt maybe that he had to prove, uh, make a name for himself uh, pianistically because he had such a talent for piano. He was the first one probably to treat the piano like an orchestra mm -hmm. uh, after Beethoven maybe. Beethoven started, but in a classical style obviously, but, but Liszt I think was really went uh, uh, we went from an ensemble to the Philharmonic, if you will. <laughs> I mean, uh, uh, with Liszt, it was like really hugely uh, orchestral, hugely colorful, and very difficult by, this, by, by the same token. And uh, he was perceived as being able to play all these notes and then da 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 da. But what is important is that even if there are lots of notes, in the Dante Sonata, for example, there are tons of notes in there, but, uh, but it's great music, you know? It's like the, the, the intention of, of expression and the style is, is really, I think, is really, really great. He's been uh, a pretty special composer for you um, throughout oh your yeah. career. Oh hasn't yeah. I mean, You've always yeah. featured his music. A very, very special, and also I always thought <coughs> uh, he was very adventurous harmonically to the point where his last compositions, for example, are atonal. I mean, they, they, they finish when they finish, you know, it's like you suspend it totally up in the air. And if you go a few years after that, a few years after his death, which was 86, you know, you're getting you're getting to the young Schoenberg and and uh, the, you know the, uh, the Viennese school. And so he had an influence on these people because the young Schoenberg was very romantic in style, and he had an influence on these people, and and he helped these people write music that were. Uh, that was at atonal, and the, the, the you know uh, the invent the decaphonism after that, and then Webern came on the scene, and uh, we we had a language that th there was a tremendous evolution of the of the musical language after that. Now you've you've alluded to this already, saying that Liszt was a composer, or was regarded in some quarters as a composer of excess. Uh, his music's yeah. too extravagant. It's flashy. It's showy. Um, it, it's sort of all out there, as we'd say today. Have you noticed a change in perception, the way people are receiving this these days, as opposed to maybe 20, 30 years ago? Uh, I suppose that, uh, well, there is, uh, you know, there, there, I, I, I think simply that maybe there is a, in my own personal experience, I think I could say, if I only answer for myself, I think I could say yes. But at the same time, uh, I know I can play list well, and I feel that uh, he's, of all composers, he's one composer that you should not play if you don't believe in him 100%. Because uh, his form is extremely flexible, 
but it can sound that uh, that same form uh, can sound very uh, unbuttoned to say the least if you if you don't play it with a certain taste and a certain style yeah. that's appropriate and a lot of people come to list and have this kind of virtuoso approach and and you know there's nothing poetic left or nothing nothing uh, musical left and and they bang keys uh, and then it's maybe I don't know. I mean, I guess it uh, must be impressing some people. It doesn't impress me, but you know, uh, I think I, I, that's why I play music exactly. It's to it's to show the poetic side of Liszt and the musical side of Liszt. Because when he decided to compose really good music, he could sit down and do it. And his writing for the piano was still phenomenally good. Um, and when he decided to play, well, I mean, you know, the, these fantasies and showing off uh, how fast and da da da, he could do things. He, he also composed uh, pieces that were phenomenally interesting for the piano. Yeah. But, you know, maybe it's more interesting pianistically than musically. Let me know? just back up a little bit about Liszt's piano music. Mm -hmm. we're, we're talking about one or two works here or there. You played the second book of the Annie de Pellerinage. Uh, about 60 minutes worth, a good 60 minutes worth of music. All three books are about three hours of music. Mm -hmm. um, do you want to take a guess how many minutes of music he comp how many minutes of piano music he composed? Oh my God, he has he has more enormous. I, I it was it would be a wild guess because his production is more than Schumann and Chopin put together. And I think there was there was another romantic also. I think much more. I'll than, give you a clue. These, it's uh, a twenty gigabyte download. A twenty gigabyte. <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay, that's a two thousand eleven <laughs> answer. <laughs> if I ever heard one. Yes. All right, it's uh, ninety nine CDs. 90, one yeah. big box. Oh my God. Seven thousand two hundred and sixty six minutes. I had. I, I but with Andre Laplante's tempo, six and a half thousand minutes. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's why. That's why. Uh, no, I, I, I knew it was a ridiculous figure like that. It's it's amazing, and you have to realize also that they were traveling. They were traveling. Uh, with horse buggies and stuff in that in that time, you know, and also the other thing is that they did not have the pens that we have today, you know. Yeah. I mean, they, they had to. I mean, Ink. that's it, it. It sounds maybe insignificant, but it's not. You know, when you when you compose a piece and you constantly have to dip your pen like this and yeah. have a production like this, he has like I think I read four books of correspondence yes, that, the that he had, of like an unbelievable yeah. amount of correspondence that he had. Uh, all the concerts that he organized, that he conducted, because he was also a conductor at the end of his life, especially. Uh, I mean, his orchestral it's music, soft. his choral music, everything, uh, everything. His songs. Yeah, he was yeah. everywhere, and I think he was uh, one of the most influential, influential force in music. Yeah, absolutely. You share a hairdresser, don't you? The what? <laughs> the, I share the <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we say that. I don't speak Hungarian, but. Uh, <laughs> I mean, Liszt never spoke Hungarian in his life. No, that's also right. that's a that's a known fact because he was out of the country for too long. And he spoke German basically, but no, it's no. I've been told. Yes, I've been told. It's funny, but uh, I don't know. Let's I, I look don't. at some of the 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 real achievements. You've mentioned a lot of them, but let, let's look at them point by point and give me your thoughts. Liszt basically invented the piano recital. I mean, nobody gave recitals on a, nobody toured uh, to give piano recitals side profile on, you know, to, to an audience who came specifically to hear him. So he's responsible for all that. For, really. for, uh, for all that, yes. Uh, he, I don't know how many concerts he played in his life. My God, that would be that would be another statistic yeah. that would be amazingly interesting to know. But uh, no, he was he was the first one, yes, because he he had a pretty phenomenal memory. And uh, he could, I, I think he had what we call a photographic memory. Uh, yeah. He could look at the score and pretty much, you know, imprint it in his, in his brain like that. And having the means that he had, uh, it, you know, it didn't take him a very long time to routine technically whatever he, he had to play. Um, so I think he had an enormous repertoire and he was going around uh, playing all these, all these, all these pieces uh, by heart. 
and little by little they, they became longer events with an intermission and mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you know bef because the events before were mixed he, he had a little bit of ensemble a little bit of orchestra yes. uh, kind of a little musical bit sandwich that, really with uh, yeah. piano in the middle uh, exactly it all, yes. exactly sometimes yeah. a bit of in sonata for violin and piano yes. then a bit of in piano sonata and he did some of that at, especially at the beginning but then uh, he decided that he want to um, he wanted to be on his own, uh, and I think one of the reasons also was he wanted to be on his own to play the music he wanted to play, and those Beethoven symphonies we talked about, and mm -hmm. and and to uh, you know to do. He was already extremely known, were extremely well known at the time. He didn't. I imagine he was there. The, the he was the right man at the right time too, because yeah. uh, the pianos were changing in those days, weren't they? And they were able to take the more uh, powerful music. Oh, yeah. Oh yeah, and larger yeah. audiences. That, That's right. Uh, That's correct. Recital. Yeah, in this time, pianos had become. Uh, they added. They usually finished on the F in Beethoven's period, the, the low, the lowest F. Uh, they added to the. I think they added to the B or the C. Uh -huh. uh, the last A came after, but they added a, uh, a, a fourth. Uh, so I mean, it was. It became much wider, and the sound projection that you could have. I guess must have been very inspiring for him to write orchestral music on the piano because <laughs> the, the possibility was there, you know, the possibilities were there.